Um, I'm in the midst of a series of messages um, in, on the book of Proverbs entitled Advice from a Friend. Uh, I believe that in Proverbs we find very relevant, practical life issues that all of us kind of wrestle with, whether it's uh, things at work, whether it's things in our homes, uh, how we interact with the different relationships of our life. Proverbs is a very practical book. And it I kind of points out that in this journey, we can choose a way of wisdom. That way is always marked with reverence, marked with respect. Uh, it's marked with the things of God. Or we can choose really what is described as the path of folly, foolishness. And, and that really leads to hate and to sin uh, and to so much destruction in our world. And then we have those opportunities, to, uh, whether to live godly lives or le- whether to take the, the way of folly. And, and so today, uh, I want to look at a theme that's kind of interwoven within the Proverbs uh, on the issue of anger and, and how we really uh, process anger. Now, the Bible uh, really wants us to realize that anger uh, is a very natural human response that uh, when we are confronted with something uh, that happens in our lives, you know, how do we deal with that? And, and certainly, if there is a child who is being abused, you should be angry. In fact, if you're not angry, then there's something wrong with you. <laughs> if you see a grave injustice taking place and you don't stand up for that, then something's wrong with you. Uh, the biblical faith it is not, it's very different than like being stoical or, or even some of the aspects of Buddhism where it talks about alleviating your passions. Now, the Bible really has no problems with passions. It's really about how you appropriately channel. And is anger something that is driven for a godly sense of what we would call righteous indignation? or whether that anger is really self-focused because you're not getting your way. And how we delineate between what I would call godly anger and ungodly anger is really kind of the delineation between the way of wisdom or the way of folly. And and so uh, what we really are going to be looking at today is how in a healthy way We can utilize these God-given emotions, these really what I call our spiritual sixth sense uh, of anger, and and channel that in ways really to benefit the kingdom and to make a difference in our wider world. Because, friends, there are things we should get angry about. And and whether it's injustice, whether it's oppression, whether it's uh, prejudice, prejudice, uh, those are the things we need to... Uh, react to and respond to. And, and I think Proverbs gives us some, I think, very godly advice from a great friend. Let's start with a word of prayer. Lord, I pray that the words of my mouth may the meditations of all of our hearts together. Lord, I pray that they're going to be loving and acceptable in your sight. Lord, you are our rock and you are our redeemer. Amen. I think it was somewhat providential that uh, today's proverb uh, uh, really was entitled, Keep Your Cool. And of course, it happens on perhaps one of the hottest days of our year. I think it's going to make it up to about 95 today. And uh, I kind of reflected as I was coming in uh, early this morning that it was just about what, 14 years ago or so, that before we added air conditioning in here, and my first job uh, every Sunday morning was come in, and we used to have the window. You'd fly up the, you know, throw up the window and put in the screen, and and then every time an ambulance came by, you know, and and it'd get completely distracted. And that was my job. I I mean, I I would uh, try to, quote, air out the sanctuary before I filled it with hot air, but no, no. Um, (laughs) I didn't say that. You can delete that on the screen. Um, 
But uh, no, I, I remember that. And I came in today and I was just so grateful that the sanctuary was very comfortable, air conditioned, uh, you know, provides a very pleasant kind of opportunity to worship God. And so I start off the morning with a huge thank you, Lord. This is great because I don't know about you all, but when I get hot, I can be rather quick and snappy. I don't do well in heat generally. I, the cooler, the better. And I don't do well in heat. And then if you add to the equation not only heat, but then if it's now nearing noon and your stomach's starting to get a little hungry and uh, you're starting to think of when's Pastor Brian going to be done so we can go off to the Jane's or some of the restaurant, you're starting to get hungry. And then you add hot, you add hungry, and you come down with a condition they call hangry. Are you hangry? I've had experience of hangry this last week. I, uh, earlier this week, I, I came home. I was here at the church till about 6. I got home, and we'd been gone to Royal Family Kids Camp the week before. And so subsequently, uh, our, our cupboards were pretty bare. We didn't really have any food. And, and so I had on my agenda, Brian's agenda, that, uh, you know, we'd make the list, we'd run and do some errands, we'd get our groceries and come back, have rather a late dinner, you know, after we had our groceries now, you know, that we, we now had. And that was my agenda. I walked in the door and Amy said, well, what are you hungry for? And I said, oh, you know, I'm really not that hungry. Let's make our list and get rolling. And then Amy, about five minutes later, said, uh, well, Brian, what are you hungry for? And I said, really, I'm, I'm fine. Let, let's get rolling. Now, you would think, after about 29 years of marriage, that I would maybe have the little red flag come up in Pastor Brian's head that, you know, it wasn't really, what do you want for dinner? It's Amy saying, I'm hungry. And my wife is always consistently pleasant, always consistently pleasant. The very few times is when she's hungry. And so shortly after the second response of what do you want for dinner, we got into some dumb little argument. I don't even remember what it was about. And then I'd like the little light bulb went on. I better feed Amy Jo. So... Um, you know, I, I, I didn't want to have, you know, the Snickers commercial with Betty White. I love that Snickers commercial. <laughs> you know, you're just not yourself when you're hungry, you know? I mean, and I felt it was like Betty White, you know? And, and you got to put a little chocolate in her or something like that. And, and so I went in, and there's actually a condition. I didn't know this until my research. There's a, a professor at Ohio State. Brad Bushman, his name, he does extensive uh, research, believe it or not, uh, on the condition of being hangry. You think I'm making this up? I'm not. Um, Brad Bushman said, and I quote, studies indicate powerful evidence that being hangry causes you to behave more aggressively, not only against strangers in the short term, but against loved ones in the long term. And so um, I wisely decided, you know, maybe it's time we had a few leftovers in the refrigerator, heated those up, had ice cream in the freezer. And in Amy's world, it's always a good day when it ends in ice cream. So for, did the leftovers, did uh, some ice cream, and everybody was happy, and off we went. Then to the grocery store. And a constant reminder that we often get short-tempered, that we uh, have many different environmental conditions, whether it's the heat, whether it's our hunger, that really makes us abrupt, makes us maybe not as ourselves when we face those life issues. So today, uh, for the sermon, I'm going to be talking about you know, keeping your cool in the midst of the challenges of life. Now, the anger in the Bible and the witness of the biblical faith is really what can often be described as our sixth sense. What I mean by that, there are some religions uh, that state that, that you should not have any emotions, that you should squelch that, should not have desire, you should not have passion. 
Uh, Stoicism, in particular, at that time, felt that you should be very, you know, Spock, live long and prosper. And that was how you dealt with life. The biblical faith says, you know, no, God gives us our emotions to help be a fuel to motivate us to action. That anger can be something very constructive. Uh, It was looking at slavery in England that compelled William Wilberforce to launch a crusade to end slavery in England and then really through the larger world. It was his anger at seeing the conditions of slave that gave him that motivation. Certainly, in our journey of life, there are going to be things that will kind of stimulate us, will get us motivated to helping out in world events. Mothers Against Drunk Driving, it all emerged because of somebody feeling angry about a drunk driver, repeated drunk driver, who, who uh, killed a, a loved one. That was a motivation for change. Uh, and that's kind of the biblical sense, that anger properly channeled can really be a, a healthy driving force for God's energy in life. Uh, yet, the, the question then becomes, is how many times our anger gets fixated not on godly things, but on rather trivial things? There's a quote that I read that is really worth the price of the sermon today, if the truth be known. It says this, and you have to make it both male and female, but the quote is from Morley, says the measure of a man or woman, measure of a man is, can be measured by the things that make them angry. And, and I think that's a great quote because I, I know in my own journey, the things that often trip my trigger, that get my blood a-going, tend to be some of the most trivial of things. I have been, rather have a reputation of having primal screams from my office when my computer crashes after a couple of hours of work, that I get angry at computers rather easily. Just this week, I'm preparing for this message. I go home, I'm trying to do something on my phone, okay, with an app, and I was trying to type in the dumb password. And I, I thought I had the password, and I typed it in. It said it's the wrong password. I'm like, oh, I tried my other password, and it wasn't that. And then I tried a third. And by this time, my blood pressure's just getting up a little bit. And finally, I'm screaming at my dumb little smartphone. You know? And so thankfully, Luke comes to my rescue. He says, Dad, I've got this. And because my son is a digital native, I'm an immigrant, that, uh, you know... <laughs> He gets that quickly and processed that rapidly, and I was good to go. But, you know, the reality is the mark of a man is often measured by the things that make them angry. I can get mad at the dogs that leave their presence in my yard, and yet I kind of ignore persecution of Christians and other believers in other parts of the world. They're going through death and horrible things. I get mad at a telemarketer who calls me at 5 o'clock in my home line, and, and yet I, I don't get angry at robber barons who are stealing people's pension funds who, who don't have anything. You know, reality is, in this journey of life, we often get mad at the things that are pretty trivial in nature. Jesus would get mad. We have the witness in the scripture about his anger. Not only turning the money changers in the temple, you remember that account? Goes in there and he says, you've turned this house of prayer into a den of robbers. And he turns over the money changers at the temple in anger. That's self-righteous indignation. That's righteous indignation. Well, we see how Jesus was angry with the Pharisees and the Sadducees and calling them a brood of vipers, whitewashed tombs. Righteous indignation Jesus demonstrated. We see Jesus even getting angry with the disciples. Remember when they kept the little children from coming unto him? And he said, don't hinder them. Stop. Yeah, anger... Something that causes us to react 
is not just inherently bad. There can be God-directed anger that motivates us to making a difference in our wider world, but the reality is so many times we get so self-fixated on what really is tripping our triggers. And so as we turn to Proverbs, we're gonna get advice on how we should kind of process healthy anger. And one of the first things that stands out to you as you look through Proverbs is some of the Hebrew words that they utilize to describe anger. Hebrew language is great. They use a lot of word pictures. Uh, And the one of anger in particular is great. Uh, It says uh, one of the word pictures, literally the Hebrew uh, word choice, is uh, pregnant nostrils. Isn't that a great word picture? You know, you ever get so mad, you're just like... You know, you you just get inflamed nostrils. That's one of the word pictures that is utilized there uh, uh, of where you just, you get so consumed by that energy that you kind of lose sight. You you slip not into anger, but into rage. We're going to talk about that in a moment. The other word that Proverbs utilizes to help describe anger is that sense of, of boiling, uh, that's the word image there, boiling hot, you know, hot-tempered. Uh, that's often that kind of comes out where you just kind of uh, kind of get explosive. Uh, that's the other word choice. But as we begin to kind of dig into some of the individual Proverbs, let's kind of see what kind of lessons we can learn. Let's start. Uh, Proverbs, chapter 14, verse 29. Uh, Proverbs 14 um, I'm sorry. Uh, I didn't give. I didn't even do the right one. Come on, Brian. Uh, the first one is uh, Proverbs 16:32. Excuse me. I didn't think that was right. Proverbs 16:32. It's the last verse of Proverbs 16, and, and here is kind of this description uh, of how we are to uh, process uh, anger in the midst of life. How to keep our cool. One who is slow to anger is better than the mighty. The one whose temper is controlled, okay? It's not don't have temper. It's not that don't become angry, but to control that is one who captures, is the one who captures a city. In other words, uh, to be able to have healthy anger, you got to kind of keep it under control, to, to bridle it. To, to kind of stifle it somewhat. That's the first advice of our friend. It's not that you shouldn't get angry. It's you gotta have a sense of control over it. Here's the other one. Let's go into chapter 29, verse 11. A fool gives full vent to anger, but the wise quietly holds it back. Again, do you see that sense of not just giving it full reign, not being unbridled, but rather being controlled. And then coming over to chap- or verse 22 of chapter 29. One given to anger stirs up strife. The hothead causes much transgression. Again, this is what the a fruit of unbridled anger, the hothead, causes much transgression. Uh, St. Paul in the New Testament, flipping over to Ephesians chapter 4 in the New Testament now, out of Proverbs, uh, Paul kind of sums this up. He says, you know, be angry. Notice Paul doesn't say, don't be angry. You know, quit it. Don't get angry. He doesn't say that. He says, be angry, but do not sin. You see the difference, friends? We can control the emotion that comes over us. What we can control is our response to that emotion. So he says, in your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger. Boy, that is great life advice that I think we can all demonstrate in our core relationships. Uh, In your anger, do not sin. And don't let that sun, don't let it brood. Don't let it begin to intensify. Because see, that's where anger can become so toxic, is where it begins to fester and build up within us. It doesn't have an outlet. And then it begins to slip, not from anger, then into rage. And there's a huge difference between anger, uh, you know, righteous indignation is anger. 
or into consumptive rage that really begins to afflict people. And you see this across wider societies. You know, people get so fixated on one issue and they feel slighted, they feel a sense of injustice, they don't have a, the ability to forgive and subsequently it begins to consume and that's where Satan begins to work into a human heart and I'll lead them down a path of folly. Craig Barnes, uh, he puts it this way and I love this so much. He goes, the difference in anger and rage is that anger is something you possess. Anger you have control over. Anger you have a bridle upon. But rage is something that possesses you. And being possessed is always the work of the devil. You see that, friends? And so if you are brooding, if you are having something intensify in your spirit, uh, that's really a mark of evil. And, and then the question becomes, well, well, how do you kind of break that. How do you keep cool in the midst of the anger that comes in waves upon your lives? Well, I think Proverbs and biblical advice gives us some direction. He says, I think, first of all, that we've got to keep our sense of perspective. Look in Proverbs chapter 14, verse 29. Proverbs says, whoever is slow to anger has great understanding, but the one who has a hasty temper exalts folly slow to anger what is a critical step of being slow to anger is maybe take a step back get a broader picture begin to take a breath instead of just being so reactive in the advice of our friend slow to anger has great understanding the one who has a hasty temper exalts folly I think that's a critical piece of how we keep away from allowing healthy anger turn into rage. Just take a step back, get some perspective. I think the other thing is to keep accountable, to have a group of faith friends who you can uh, have a, a, a presence to go to and, and talk about your struggles. I know there have been numerous times over my journey, I, I have a Thursday morning men's group, and, and we pray and we meet, and, and there are things that are kind of uh, working in my soul that I just kind of talk about with those guys, whether it's formally or informally, and, and just that outlet. Sometimes there's some great advice that's offered um, by some of our members. It just kind of helps me get a grounding in the journey. It is so critical in this life that we don't have to feel like we do this alone. That's what faith families are for. That's why we have friends uh, who can pray for us and can support us in the journey, to be accountable one to another. And then finally, not only to keep a perspective, not only to have be accountable, but then really to do that very hard work, which is practicing forgiveness. Every Sunday, we say the Lord's Prayer. And we say some of the most revolutionary words in all of society, which is forgive us of our trespasses. We like that part. We want to be forgiven by our creator. But then we make that next claim as we forgive those who trespass against us. Boy, is that tough, difficult. Because we've been hurt, we've been wounded, we've been slighted, we've been victims of injustice, oppression, prejudice. The list goes on and on. And at that point, we've got to have a conscious decision to invoke upon God as much as we can to not only to uh, ask for strength to be forgiven by our Creator, but then to reflect that and to forgive one another. It's often said, that anger, I said anger is like our spiritual sixth sense. Anger is much like fire, okay? Fire is great. I'm really thankful for a fire on a cold night to put into a fireplace. And it's often said that forgiveness is much like water. And I know there have been times when I've been needing that quenching of a thirst. And, and, and both are gifts, fire and water. Anger, forgiveness. And the question to him, how do we be able to have that being under control? 
I mean, if we just dumped all the water on it and quenched the fire, then we don't have anything. But if we just allow the flames just to burn out of control without any kind of uh, perimeter, then it becomes a chaos. It becomes a conflagration. I, all these bad things happen. So, friends, what my hope is, is an advice from our friend to keep our cool is that we do remember as much as God has forgiven us. We are then to begin that process of extending that one to another. And in doing so, we begin to heal a world that is so deeply broken and hurting. That, that's really what our life's to be about. And it's tough. And I don't want to get up here and just gloss that over. I know some of you are out there and you've been deeply wounded. You've been torn apart. You've been burned. And, and you want to act viscerally in the midst of being burned. And that's where our faith has to come to play. That's where we have to sit there and ask for a supernatural strength to be able to be healed and to find that, that space in our soul to extend forgiveness one to another. I want to end with one of my favorite quotes. This is from uh, Frederick Buechner, and he talks about anger. Many times, anger is often considered one of the seven deadly sins, uh, and that's because it can so easily can get transformed from a righteous indignation into a consumptive rage. And, and this is what Buechner says, and I love this. He goes, of the seven deadly sins, anger is probably the most fun. We like anger. We almost kind of thrive on anger. We have a world that loves to be angry. I mean, really, you see so much anger out there, and they love it in a sick, perverted way. They love being angry. To lick our wounds, to smack our lips over grievances long past, to savor the last toothsome morsel, both of the pain you are given and the pain you are giving back. In many ways, it is a feast fit for a king. But the chief drawback is that what you're wolfing down is yourself. The skeleton of the feast is you. <laughs> you know, friends, um, the biblical advice of our friend, keep our cool. <laughs> Be able to have that balance, forgiveness and anger, and, and being able to find it and channel it really for righteous indignation, for causes where people are not being uh, uh, suffering from injustice or injury or invasion, to be able to be agents of hope and healing for a world, that's the calling of all of us in this room. Are you up for the challenge? Let's pray. Holy God, so many times these emotions of anger come upon us so quickly. Many of the things that trip our triggers, many of the things that uh, make us so hurt are pretty trivial in nature. Lord, help us to be the kind of person whose uh, measure is by the size of those things that make us angry. Help us to focus on the big things, your things, godly things, that make us compelled to make a difference. And help us not to slip into the little stuff that can really easily lead us to rage, where it can begin to be possess our soul, where we can no longer practice forgiveness. Lord, we need your strength. Fill us this morning. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. God is a consuming fire, a burning holy flame with glory and freedom. Our God is the only righteous judge, ruling over us with kindness and wisdom. We will lift our eyes to you. We will keep our eyes on you. A mighty fortress is our God. A sacred refuge is your name. Your kingdom is unshakable. And with you forever we will.
jealous for his own. None could comprehend his love and his mercy. Our God is exalted on his throne, high above the heavens, forever he is worthy. God is a consuming